you want a vision of the future, Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Someone is trying to teach me a lesson in futility. Why am I the only one who isn't killed? They will run you dizzy. They will pile falsehood on top of falsehood until you can't tell a lie from the truth and you won't even want to. That's how the powerful keep their power. Don't you read the papers? I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. I'm going to get your money for you. But if you don't get the President of the United States on that phone, you know what's going to happen to you? What? You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. It has been since man crawled out of the slime. Welcome to another episode of Our Interesting Times. It is my pleasure to have Christopher Bolin on the show. Christopher is an American investigative journalist. He's the author of Solving 9-11 uh, set of books and The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East. Uh, he has a degree in history from the University of California at Santa Cruz with his focus on Israel and Palestine. He has written extensively about the Middle East, electronic vote fraud, the dangers of depleted uranium, and the history and, and geopolitical background of the terror attacks of September 11th, 2001. He has spoken about 9-11 in America and Europe and done several speaking tours across the United States. The Solving 9-11 set of books is, are about the uh, inv- the war on terror. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not, not, not specifically on the war on terror. The Solving 9-11 set of books are about the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and, and what happened on 9-11. And those attacks were done, 9-11 was done, in order to make the war on terror operational. Mm-hmm. Um, the war on terror is a fraudulent war um, in which the United States has been dragged into the Middle East to fight wars on the behalf of the, uh, the Zionist Israel. Um, I wrote the book The War on Terror as a, as a pamphlet, almost as like, like Common Sense by Thomas Paine, to um, alert um, my fellow Americans and, and other people about the true nature of the war on terror because we have been deceived about both 9-11 and the war on terror. But, you know, here we are 17 years later. We're still fighting this war in uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, thousands of American lives have been ruined. Uh, millions of people in the Middle East have been affected. Um, and it's cost a, a ton of money. You know, do, as Donald Trump said, we've spent $7 trillion, trillion with a capital T, and we've gotten nothing for it. So in order for Americans to – in order for us to be able to resist the war, to resist the deception – um, you have to be aware of what's really going on. You have to understand what is the real strategic operational plan that is is behind the war on terror. And that's what this little book, The War on Terror, is all about. So I made it very small and easy to read, very clear, very clear text and, and, and uh, uh, easy to read because it needs to be read by a lot of people. It, and it's, it's something that's very small, can be read in a few hours and shared with your friends. That's the idea. Yeah, and, and it is. I, I, I read it, and it is. It sort of it lays out the case. And, um, well, on the back of the book, uh, on the dust jacket, I guess, at the back of it, it says, the, the government and the media have misled us about 9-11 in order to compel public opinion to support the war on terror. We have gone along with it 
Uh, why have we got why? along with it? Do yeah. we accept endless war as normal? Are we numb to the suffering caused by our military interventions? No, we have simply been propagandized into submission. We have been deceived into thinking that the war on terror is a good thing, a valiant struggle against terrorists who intend to attack us as we were on 9-11. Behind the war on terror is a, is a strategic plan crafted decades in advance to redraw the map of the Middle East. 9-11 was a false flag operation blamed on Muslims in order to start the military operation for that strategic plan. Recognizing the origins of the plan is crucial for undermining the deception that has changed our world. Now, that's quite a statement. Um, mm -hmm. It's completely different to the popular or, or narrative of, of 9-11. So uh, let's lay out the case. So it wasn't mm -hmm. this rogue group, Al-Qaeda, that pulled this off, that outsmarted American air defense and brought down the, the, the towers and attacked the Pentagon and these things. Mm -hmm. uh, what What's the history of the war on terror? You go a little further back in history and who was mm -hmm. really behind it? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing to understand, as you've alluded to, is uh, to understand that we've been lied to about September 11th. When you understand that, um, if you don't understand that, then you're, you, you haven't gotten to first base. But if you understand that we've been lied to about 9-11, then the question is, well, why? Why did they do this, this huge deception? Why, have, why has the media and the government gone along with this deception? What's the purpose? What's the reason? Well, the reason is the war on terror. And the war on terror is, is an older doctrine, an older conspiracy plot that was rolled out publicly the first time in 1979 by Benjamin Netanyahu and his father at something called the Netanyahu Institute, the Jonathan Institute, named after his brother, in Jerusalem. And it was July 1979. It was a four-day conference. George Herbert Walker Bush spoke at the, on the final day. He was running for president at the time. And this was when they first presented in what is what's called a propaganda offensive with a lot of media people and politicians from around the world, 700 people assembled. They, they rolled out this doctrine, the Israeli military intelligence, um, that no longer would the main issue be human rights, but the new issue would be uh, fighting terrorism terrorism, international terrorism. And at the time, 1979, middle of the Cold War, the Israelis put the blame for all international terrorism on the, on the Kremlin. They blamed the Soviet Union for being the sponsor of international terrorism. This was, of course, done to bring the United States into uh, taking on a new, a new role in fighting the Cold War by, by fighting Palestinians. By, it was meant to delegitimize uh, the resistance to Israel, basically. So the Palestinians were seen as proxies of Russia, and, and anybody who attacked Israel was a terrorist. And therefore, they said it's the role of the West, the United States and the Western allies, to come to the Middle East to basically wage war against the enemies of Israel because those enemies of Israel are fundamentally opposed to the West. So – by lumping themselves, by grafting Israel onto the West, they said, ah, it's, it's your problem too. And this is the same thing they did on 9-11, you know, when, when, they, when they pulled over the Israeli uh, intelligence oper operatives in New Jersey. The first thing they told the police is, hey, hey, dudes, we're not, we're not Palestinian, we're Israelis. The Palestinians are the problem. The Palestinians are the problem, not us. So it's, it's, it's the Israeli way of thinking is that constantly blame the Arabs and the Palestinians while they themselves are actually the masterminds of the terror. So, well, when you, if you read my book, Solving 9-11, The Deception Changed the World, you'll see all the evidence that I lay out to show that the September 11th attacks were a false flag operation carried out by Israeli intelligence and their agents in the United States. Um, and then it was covered up. And instead of investigating the crime, the American public was given a prepared story, a narrative, um, starting on day one, basically, blaming Osama bin Laden and basically calling for the United States to go to war against Osama bin Laden. And that's where, we, that's where we've been for the last 17 years. And if you, if you don't understand um, the relationship between the false flag 9-11 attack and the war on terror, you will never be able to get out of it. And, you know, look at the history. 17 years we've been in it. It's destroying America. People who don't think it's destroying America need to take a trip around the country and see what it's done. 
Americans are suffering. We've lost a lot of uh, jobs. We've lost a lot of prosperity. We've lost a lot of prestige. We've lost a lot of our, our self, not self-confidence, but our self-esteem because our nation is doing basically war fighting in situations where we shouldn't be fighting wars at all. Like the shooting we had the other day down in, um, in uh, Ventura County in uh, Thousand Oaks. This young man he had been he had he had been a marine u s marine and he had gone over there his his occupation in Afghanistan for about seven months was a machine gunner so he was a guy who rode around and and shot shot the machine gun at people and this obviously causes a great deal of psychological problems you know the the one thing that you cannot recover from is wrongfully taking somebody's life and he probably took more than one and and you know he's uh he kind of lost his soul, lost his mind and came back and lost his wife, was living at home with his mom. And I don't know if he, if he didn't do it, he made a perfect uh, Manchurian candidate. But in any case, it looks like he probably did it because he was so upset with himself. So just in such despair that he took his, took, took other people's lives. So the whole thing is that we have to understand the war on terror because the, the war on terror has to end. You know, we, Donald Trump's been president for two years. We hope that he'll come around to understanding that this is a rotten deal. He's pointed out on several occasions the cost of the war and the lack of any benefit for the American people. So let's end this thing. You mentioned um, that 9-11 being a, a false flag. And in your book, and of course in your many uh, uh, lectures that you've given it, you can see on YouTube and in your other books, uh, you provide a, a history of Israel's involvement in false flags. So if you can like provide some of that uh, grammar, maybe people wouldn't be so uh, shocked to hear that 9-11 was yet another example of, of um, Israeli uh, uh, false flag, of another Israeli false flag attack. Yeah. So uh, a brief history yeah. of Israeli false flags. Can you give us a little? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, that's the thing is, that, you see, um, I, I lived in Israel uh, after high school. I went over there. I was traveling around the Middle East and I wound up in Israel. And um, I learned about Zionism from Zionists who built the country, basically people from Eastern Europe who had come and settled in the Jordan Valley on one of those things called a kibbutz, a collective farm. And these people were, you know, dyed in the wool um, Zionists from Eastern Europe who thought that their their religious and their, I don't know what their mission was to come and reestablish a Jewish state in, in Palestine. And um, that's who I learned about Palestine and I mean about who I learned about Israeli history and Zionism from. And uh, if you read history of Zionism, of the state of Israel and before the state of Israel, you'll, you'll realize that Israel was created by terrorists, by people who used terrorism as their modus operandi. Um, the, 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 you know, they, they we're talking about groups like the um, Lehi or the Stern Gang. Um, Irgun, headed by Menachem Begin, and and even even the Haganah participated in, in things like bombing the King David Hotel in 1946 in Jerusalem, killing 93 people. At the time, the Jerusalem uh, King David Hotel was the headquarters of the British authorities in Mandate Palestine. Uh, at, after World War One, Palestine was uh, under a mandate of uh, control by the British military, and uh, they. After they blew up the King David Hotel, a few a few months later, they blew up the uh, uh, British Embassy in in Italy in Rome. And they uh, about that time they also sent letter bombs to uh, the Foreign Ministry in London. They also sent letter bombs to the Truman White House. Um, something a lot of people don't know, but uh, Truman's daughters had you know wrote about it that they the, the, the Zionists sent letter bombs to the Truman White House, very much like we're seeing today with these letter bombs or you know odd. Packages coming to congressmen, what have you. Um, and then they uh, – in, in the 1950s, early 1950s, after Israel became a state, um, they uh, uh, used false flag terrorism in Egypt to try to drive a wedge between the United States and Egypt. And they put bombs in U.S. and British uh, facilities like uh, theaters and uh, libraries and cultural centers in, in Egypt. And, of course, during the war in which Israel was created, they used terrorism to uh, drive the Palestinian population out of the, out of the country. Um, there was one massacre that's notorious called um, Dir Yassin, in which uh, Menachem Begin 
and his 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 fellow Irgunists, they attacked a, a village and and massacred everybody and took a few prisoners a few prisoners left over and paraded them through the streets of Jerusalem uh, and this this uh, this massacre was meant to instill fear in the greater Palestinian population so that they would uh, flee and it worked really well because when you when you when you when you inculcate fear in a population then they will become very malleable very you know easily led this is exactly what happened after 9/11 by the way 9/11 was done to increase the fear factor in the American population and then then they went global by putting bombs in places like Madrid and uh, uh, London and Bali so that the uh, international citizen the world citizen became fearful and and accepting of whatever remedy was offered by the authorities to uh, eradicate terrorism hence the war on terror but then you know then they did other things like in, in the 1960s the Israeli military openly attacked an American vessel a Navy vessel uh, off the coast of Egypt this ship was called the USS Liberty and on June 8 1967 the Israeli Air Force and Navy uh, attacked this ship with torpedoes and uh, with uh, with uh, jet aircraft and killed and killed or injured two thirds of the crew. The USS Liberty remains the most decorated ship in the in the U.S. Navy, um, and and yet it's it's a piece of history that most Americans don't know anything about because it's suppressed because it's a clear case of the Israel Israeli military attacking an American vessel with the intention of killing all the Americans on board and putting the ship on the bottom of the sea. So these are some of the things that give you some background. And this is also the reason why, in my opinion, why Zionist history is not taught at American colleges. I studied history at the University of California, but this history is not taught because if it were taught, the entire understanding, the American understanding of Israel and Zionism would would be different. Also, um, uh, you know, many people are aware of USS Liberty now and also the Levon affair is that you know, as it's mm-hmm. become the no- known. Uh, but one thing I always find interesting, or I find recently interesting, that even the uh, the 1983 bombing uh, of the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the 86 bombing in the uh, discotheque in Italy or Germany that was blamed on Muammar Gaddafi, as well as the Achille Lauro uh, uh, incident mm-hmm. was, um, was, well, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, these were indeed Mossad operations, Israeli mm-hmm. intelligence operations, false flags. Mm-hmm. And so this fundamentally right. changes the history of these events in many people's eyes, you know, how they remember right. them. Yeah. There was a book that came out this year uh, written by an Israeli guy named Ronan Bergman. The book is called, um, uh, let's see, Rise and Kill First. I think that's what it's called, Rise and Kill First. It's a, a book about Israel, Mossad, assassinations over history. And in this book, which was on the New York bestseller list um, this year, this Israeli writes about that the Israeli military had had a uh, terrorist operation running in Lebanon for four years, from 1979 until at least 1983, in which they 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 uh, would put truck bombs and car bombs in front of Palestinian buildings or Syrian buildings or Lebanese buildings, and and blow up the whole street. And as you said. In 1983, in October, one of the most notorious car bombings was that of the uh, French and Mar- American Marine barracks, um, in which something like 271 Americans were killed. It was the worst. It was the worst loss of, of American Marines since the Iwo Jima battle in World War II. And the uh, Casper Weinberger, who was Secretary of Defense at the time, has said, even years later, that we, the United States, has no knowledge. Of who did this bombing? In the popular history, if you read the, you know, go to Wikipedia or something, they'll tell you that oh, this is done by Hezbollah, it's done by Iran. No, there's no evidence whatsoever linking Iran or Hezbollah to this bombing. This was done by, and what we do know is that the Israeli Mossad knew exactly about the bombing. They knew the kind of truck, the Mercedes truck, the license plate, where it was being where it was being prepared, and they also knew when the specific time of the bombing, the, the date and time. Yet they didn't tell the American military any of this. And the head of the Mossad, this is written in a, a book about the Mossad by a former Israeli Mossadnik named um, Ostrovsky, Victor Ostrovsky. The book is called By Way of Deception. And he says that uh, the head of the Mossad, Mossad at the time said, no, the Americans are big guys. They, they can take care of themselves. Just give them the basics. And the basics were 
you know, a car bomb could be coming any day now. Be prepared. Well, it was Sunday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. The Marines were all sleeping, and a, a big Mercedes car bomb just drove up the front door and blew up and killed 271 of them. And the evidence all indicates, this historical evidence that we have now, that Israel had been doing car bombs for four years in Lebanon prior to this, all being done by a secret group called uh, Front for the Liberation of, of Lebanon from Foreigners. And it's most likely that they were involved in the, obviously, that they were involved in the, in the bombing of the Marine barracks. So this gives you some idea. When you understand this history, you understand that Israel is not a friend of the United States at all. That the United States, Israel has actually committed uh, acts of war against the United States prior to 9-11, like the sinking uh, attack on the USS Liberty. That's an act of war. Um, so that basically um, they're not our friend at all. And they've attacked us before and, and very viciously, and they, they do whatever they have to do to get their strategic goal uh, achieved. And um, you mentioned, Chris, the, uh, the Jerusalem Conference in 1979, this key event, uh, George H.W. Bush and many other journalists and other uh, government officials or former government officials attended. And you say this was sort of a laying out of a, of a, of a psychological warfare strategy for the next 30 years, planning what was going to unfold because the Cold War is coming to an end. Of course, you mentioned how they're trying to pin terrorism on the Soviet Union. That's beneficial during the Cold War era, that that, that dialectic. But then the mm -hmm. coming war on terror, they had to sort of change the atmosphere of perception of things. And this is coordinated not only through the news, what we call the media, but also through entertainment and popular culture, correct? And this just mm -hmm. seems to be coordinated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much so. It's like in, in that conference it was in 1979. It was a propaganda offensive to roll out the doctrine of the war on terror. But just the year before, the is, Israel's number one intelligence agent, a man named Arnon Milchan, who's also known as a Hollywood producer, made JFK and Pretty Woman and Brazil, movies like that. This guy, his very first movie he made, he's an Israeli, he made a movie called The Medusa Touch in which the climactic scene is a Boeing passenger aircraft smashing into the Pan Am building in New York City. And, 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 and the, the very same year or the next year, the head of Israeli intelligence, a man named Iser Harel, predicted to an American, American uh, Zionist evangelist named um, Evans, he told him that, that Arabs would attack the tallest building in New York City. And, 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 and he, this, this he predicted. He made this prediction in 1979. So that you see, you have, you have Israelis making movies about planes flying into buildings. You have the founding father of, the, of Israeli intelligence predicting that Arabs will, will attack the tallest buildings in New York City, and, which happens, what, 20, 22 years later? So it's like, what's going on here? What, what is, this, is, this is just some of the basic um, uh, clues that that this was this was becoming a plot that was it was taking shape, that was being um, presented. This is something called ideation. The idea was being put out there, was being put out there in movies, being put out there in in interviews, being put out there in books. Um, Menach, uh, excuse me, not Menachem Begin, but uh, his 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 uh, his protege um, ben Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, after the conference in 1979, he he started cranking out books, in which he he began pushing. The idea of the war on terror as what the United States needed to do in the future. And he, in one of the books, I think the 1995 version of, of one of the books, he predicted – also he said that um, you know, if you don't do something now, it, you know, the Arab terrorists might put a nuclear bomb in the basement of the World Trade Center, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like all of, this, all of this ideation is being put out there in the decades prior to 9-11. So that when 9-11 does happen, I mean, this is including the 1993 bombing, the uh, TV shows and movies that have been made about that. Yeah, the this is all done. Then. It's all been done to prepare the American public to um, accept, the, uh, accept the narrative most easily given that this was done by Arabs and now it's time to go to war, to wage war against the people who did 9-11. This is how it's done. And, 19, of course, the 1993 bombing, the truck bombing of the World Trade Center – a failed attempt to bring the towers down, as the uh, official narrative goes, but it, it, you you suggest that that might have been just a well a, an intentional failed attack to, to, to sort of uh, get the public ready for it for for the eventual attack nine you know eight yes. years later. And of course, yes. the, uh, 
people who've looked into that know that the, the, that attack was indeed a sting operation by the FBI gone bad. <laughs> so there's that all the FBI is all over it. But you seem to suggest that it's probably it was, it was kind of like a hijacked or controlled Israeli operation. Um, well, it was uh, it was an FBI operation for mm -hmm. sure. They were involved in it. Yeah. Um, and but then you had, you know, the prosecutor from New Jersey was a man named um, Michael Shertoff. And he's the guy who prosecuted it because the gang uh, was hanging out there in New Jersey City or something like that. And so he was the main prosecutor. And he was then also the prosecutor for 9-11. Um, he himself is an Israeli national. He, he's a, his mother was a Mossad agent. And he was raised in Israel and, and partly in the United States. And he was the assistant attorney general in 9-11. But um, – what what the 1993 bombing was was not a, they weren't really trying to bring down the World Trade Center. It wasn't going to happen that way. Yeah. What it was meant to do it was meant to prime the pump uh, again to prepare the American public for um, so that they would accept the the 9/11 uh, attacks as presented to them. Uh, what I mean to say is that there were movies made, for example, where at the end of the movie they have the terrorist in the back of the you know, police car or whatever, and he's driving past the World Trade Center, and he sees the two towers. He says, "Next time we'll bring them both down." So the the, the public then sees this and says, "Oh, that nasty Arabs! They tried to bring down the World Trade Center." So that when, in fact, the the World Trade Center is brought down, you know, eight years later, people naturally say, "Oh yeah, did you see the movie? Yeah, that, that's exactly what they did back." You know, so that's how you, they they prepare the public um, to accept their narrative when in fact the evidence if people look at the evidence anybody with with any uh you know honesty who looks at the evidence of 9-11 will quickly determine that you know we've been completely lied to about what happened on 9-11 yeah this is commonly referred to as predictive programming or cultural programming mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. now uh, you met you mentioned uh people like chertoff this dual citizen mm -hmm. whose parent mother is a Mossad agent yet he's mm -hmm. the u.s attorney general then later head of homeland security so you have mm -hmm. Uh, someone, I guess, whose loyalties can be questioned just based on his pedigree, I think is fair to say. Um, but um, uh, with 9-11, with, uh, it was called an act of war, which is an important uh, important choice of words by people like Richard Pearl and mm -hmm. Dick Cheney. Can you make the point? Because what this does is this makes it an act of war, and there's no real, uh, uh, I guess, political will for a sort of a detailed, thorough criminal investigation of the event so all the propaganda can be utilized to, you know to create war fever and ter terrorize the public uh what what's the importance of calling this thing an act of war well an act of war is a legal term and an act of war then makes it something that is then in the president's um it's a war it's an act of war it's, and and then they say that usually an act of war requires um a state actor being accused of, of attacking another state. Uh, in this case, they said this was done by uh, this gang of guys, Al Qaeda, from um, Afghanistan. Therefore, since they have the protection of the Afghan government, we will then wage war against the Taliban and the Afghan government. Um, but but the, the fact that they called it an act of war is very important. That was done on day one. On day one, it was determined that this was an act of war, not a crime. Before any evidence had been assembled, before any investigation had started, they said it's an act of war. USA Today came out the next day with a, a figure saying that 86% 86 of the population said it was an act of war. And then the next day, of course, they passed this authorization to use military force uh, bill in Congress, which was only one paragraph long basically and says that the president has the right to wage war against anybody who has participated or – he determines – that the president determines has any responsibility for the, the, the attacks of 9-11 or anybody who harbors them. And this is the meaning of this, the, the language of this has been a little bit you know, strengthened or, or widened in the past uh, 17 years. So that now this authorization use military force has been used across you know, a dozen countries in the Middle East, not just, not just Afghanistan. So it's, 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 it's very important to understand that the, by calling it an act of war, it precluded the possibility of – or it precluded the need for a proper criminal investigation. That's very important to understand. Americans need to understand that on 9-11 was the worst act of mass murder and terrorism in U.S. history, and it has never been investigated as a crime 
people like to, people like to think that oh yeah the media told us that it's, it's been investigated everything's fine it's never been investigated forget about it the evidence was destroyed and the um uh the nation went to war because it was declared an act of war that's the important thing about understanding the difference this it's a legal term and it's it it, it took us to war rather than a criminal investigation what evidence has the other has the federal government ever manifested or provided to uh, uh, to prove or at least uh, 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 indict uh, Osama bin Laden as the ringleader in Al Qaeda? None, none, <laughs> yeah. none, man. Don't you remember? I mean, it's like was it Colin Powell sat there and said, "We'll we'll we'll, we'll have the evidence. We're gonna we're, we're gonna go to war with Afghanistan. We're gonna give you the evidence soon." The, the evidence was never forthcoming, never. There's never been any evidence to uh, make the case that Osama bin Laden did it, that Taliban had anything to do with it, um, that uh, you know Al Qaeda, nothing. Uh, so they 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 front loaded all of this these claims in a uh, in, in a prepared narrative, and the narrative was first given to the American public and to the world by the head of Israeli uh, military, Ehud Barak, who appeared on uh, BBC World Television just before the towers fell or just after the towers fell, just very early in the day. And he said, oh, we know who did this. This is Osama bin Laden, and we know where he is. He's in Afghanistan. He said, now is the time for the United States to begin an operational concrete war against terrorism. That's basically it. So the Israelis interpreted 9-11 for us. And this is very important to understand. There was that General uh, Wesley Clark, when he was running for president back in 2007, he spoke about this, and he talked about the memo that he that he that he was told about when he went to the Pentagon shortly after 9/11, and this memo he said um, said that the United States should will overthrow seven countries in the Middle East in five years, and he listed them, and it started with Iraq and Syria, and then you know Libya and uh, Lebanon or, or uh, these other countries, uh, Sudan was one of them, and then it finished with Iran, and and uh, you know this is the memo, and this is exactly this is the this is the agenda. But he he also said what we had after 9/11. He says we didn't have American understanding of it. What is he saying? What does he what does he mean? We didn't have American understanding of 9/11. What's he talking about? What he's saying is that we had foreign understanding of 9/11 provided to us. Well, who who who, entra- who interpreted 9/11 for us? Was it the Germans, the the Japanese? Who, who, I don't understand. It was the Israelis. The Israelis interpret the Middle East for the American military nine times out of ten. Because the Americans, the United States, we don't have the language people. We don't have the – perhaps a little bit better now, but we don't have the, the human intelligence, nor do we have really the inclination to be involved in the Middle East. This is Israel's you know, backyard, and, and the Israelis have the inside edge in the U.S. Defense Department, and they – I mean, look at the look at the the Defense Policy Board on 9/11. It was all Zionist neocons: Paul Wolfowitz, Dov Zakheim, Richard Pearl, uh, Douglas Feith. This is the Defense Policy Board. This is the board of appointed people who craft the policy that the Pentagon puts into effect. Whoa, 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 whoa! This is this is very wrong. But this is how it works. So these are the guys who crafted the policy of overthrowing seven countries in five years. And that's where we've been for the last 17 years. Our system is broken. The, um, uh, the, uh, now, you, you say the war on terror is a strategy that was uh, laid out uh, by Israel to uh, achieve a strategic objective that they see in their interest. What is that objective? Well, it's very interesting that you asked it like that. Um, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1948, before Israel became a state, did 13 papers about what, what a Zionist state in Palestine would mean to U.S. military. And they said, they, they, they declared in the 13th paper that it, it, you know, it, Zionist strategy would, would seek to involve the United States military in an ever-widening and ever-deepening conflict in the Middle East. And to achieve Jewish goals. And the Jewish goals, that, two of the Jewish goals that they listed in this paper, one was the, uh, um, the growth of the uh, state of Israel, the greater Israel, into Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, etc. Taking t- 
territory of their neighbors, growing in size and, and increasing their, their, their land territory. And secondly, to, uh, to put into effect is Jewish hegemony over the entire Middle East. And that's kind of where we are right now, is that the, the U.S. operations in Syria and Iraq have been to uh, break down the central authority and the secular government in those countries – and to replace it with a broken, fractured country, uh, which in a process called Balkanization, which is very similar to what was done to Yugoslavia. You take a, a secular socialist country like Yugoslavia and you break it into seven pieces, like Humpty Dumpty, and you never put it back together again. And those seven countries, little ethnic statelets, are poorer and weaker um, than, than ever. And that's the plan for the Middle East. That's what the Israelis want to do. It's something called the Yanon Plan. That's uh, named after a guy named Oded Yanon. And this plan came out in 1982. He was an advisor to um, uh, the, the defense minister at the time, Ariel Sharon. And the idea was that they would Israel would break up countries like Lebanon and Syria and Iraq so that they, they ceased to be uh, centrally operated countries and they would instead be fragmented countries with ethnic groups here and there. And that's what the United States is unfortunately doing in Syria and Iraq. And you, you, you see that more as just more than a coincidence. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you, you, the, well, wait a minute. I don't know. How, you have to ask yourself. I don't know how much you know about the Middle East, but the United States has no, no interest whatsoever in Syria. We had some interest in, in Iraq, not much. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a region that's not our – it's not our business. You know, we shouldn't be in Syria. We've, we've, been, we've been spending – under Obama and Clinton, the United States began a program where they were spending a billion dollars a year um, on covert militias to try to overthrow the government of Syria. Well, Hillary Clinton, in one of those emails that was uh, uh, you know, released by uh, WikiLeaks, she said that in or the best way to help Israel, she wrote, is to use, mili is to use force to overthrow the government of Syria. She, the best way to help Israel – she wrote. It's like, wait, isn't she the you know Secretary of Defense for the United States of America? Why are why are we bending over backwards, waging war to break up a country for Israel? Well, this is the this is what my book is all about. You have to understand that the the, the plan that's being put into effect in the Middle East, um, in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, uh, is is an Israeli plan. It's a Zionist plan um, to give them control of the Middle East. Um, and in which, in which the United States is being used like an ox with a ring in its nose and being pulled by the nose to trample this state, trample that state, trample this state. And, and this, this is an abuse of the American military. The American military needs to be uh, pulled out of these areas to be extracted from these, these, these criminal wars. And we need to you know, uh, uh, separate U.S. interest from Israeli interest. You know, but what, unfortunately, what's happened in the last 20, 30 years is that the Israelis and the Zionists have taken control of our – they've hijacked our nation militarily, uh, financially, in many ways. You know, they, they've, they've hijacked our country. Yeah, the financial angle is very important to understand because if you look at it, the final analysis, uh, these expensive wars that are paid for with borrowed money are from central banks that are ultimately owned by groups like the Rothschilds. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the, you know, by by in, by indebting the country to the degree that we become indebted, the banking the banksters who control the debt, who buy the debt, um, become the creditors. They become they become like the overlords of our nation, and you know, you know, like Donald Trump, for example, he has a history with these Rothschild bankers. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he has a he went he went bankrupt a few times, and and uh, and but. He, at the same time, he knows the importance of, of money. He knows the importance of getting a good deal. He has spoken about the bad deal that we have in the Middle East with vis-a-vis -vis the, the war in Syria and Afghanistan. So Mr. Trump, do something about it. What, you know, and, and if he doesn't do something about it in the, in the very near future, um, you know, it, I, I, I can't see how anybody can, can, can take him at his word because he has said time and time again that we are spending way too much money and 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 you know now this the shooting down in California, in which the guy was a, a veteran from Afghanistan, 
you know, it's not a matter of guns. It's not that it, 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 that we have a problem with guns in America. You know, the Swiss have guns and the Israelis have guns. Um, we have a problem with 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 a, a generation of young people who have been who have been indoctrinated with violence, trained and 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 turned into you know machine gunners like this young man, and they come back to their civilian life in America and they're they're lost. Yeah, the war comes home, and, and yeah, uh, like, some people even trace the many of the serial killers of the seventies to the Vietnam War. Uh, and yeah. sort of the the, uh, the cultural uh, uh, degradation that, that ensued in these things. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, know, you can't really take, look at these things in a vacuum or, or separate them from the, from their cultural historical context. Uh, a good example, just even the the thirty eight billion dollars that we're going to be giving the Israel the next ten years, I think, is is borrowed money from right. Rothschild controlled banks, and that just is the, right. the financial trickery. Where is U.S. Congress in this? They're supposed to. Right. We're, we're mentioning the abuses largely of the executive branch. Right, this, but where is our Congress, the representative of the people, and exercise <laughs> some oversight? Have, well, have they're, any, they're, any, they're, any insights on that? <laughs> they're completely beholden to this this uh, Zionist monster. I mean, it's like they're the ones who authorized this payment. This, you know, it was it was a bill that was crafted by Congress that was then signed by Obama to give Israel the thirty eight billion dollars over ten years. It was an increase, a large increase in their yearly stipend. Um, but, um, you know, you look at what happened when this Netanyahu – Netanyahu is one of the architects of terrorism. He's one of the architects, masterminds of the 9-11 attack. And when he spoke to Congress, a joint session of Congress, he got something like 29 standing ovations, more <laughs> than the president. I mean people – anytime he used the word stand, for example, people would stand up and applaud him. Yes. Well, he hadn't said anything important. It's, it was almost, just, it's, it's Stalinist almost. It's yeah. bizarre. It's bizarre. Yeah. I mean, just look at it sometime. Look at this event. He, the people, he says, like, stand, and the whole Congress stands up and applauds this guy. <laughs> oh, he hasn't said anything. You know, what, there's no – so they're like trained seals, you know? And, and, and this is the problem. I mean, I can understand why Congress has such low popularity ratings among the American people because they have – they are completely – they're they're venal. They have they they are they are operating. They are serving their their ma their paylords, their paymasters, and and you know the the Zionist influence in Congress is is it has to be eradicated. You know we have to we have to pass laws to prevent. You know one thing we have to do is we have to make APAC Israel Israeli lobby has to, they have to register as a foreign a foreign lobby for crying out loud. American Israel lobby is lobbying for the state of Israel. They should be declared a foreign, a foreign lobby, a you know, foreign interest group, and treated as foreign agents. And I think and, the last it, president to try to do that was John F. Kennedy, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, this this has to be done. <laughs> and and you know this idea that that people can be a uh, dual nationals, have uh, two passports, and serve the U.S. government, wrong. I mean, it it never was like that before in the past. It shouldn't be like that because a man cannot serve two masters. You know, like a person like Sheratov can't serve Israel and America at the same time. And what he did with the 9-11 non-investigation, he was serving Israel. There was no investigation of 9-11 because the person responsible for the investigation of 9-11 was an Israeli agent, Michael yeah, Shertoff. Yeah, yeah you, make that, you, you, you make that point. Um, is, uh, there's a series of uh, key moments that are Zionist agents that are there uh, to stifle any real investigation, right? At every point. At every point. And so that it, 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 it's become 100% consistent. So that you know, when when you when you now find a new important angle that you need to that, that clearly something's been covered up. For example, the last one I recall was the uh, NIST report, uh, 2005, I think it was NIST report mm -hmm. on the collapse of the buildings, and this report was clearly a cover up. This is where the NIST, the guys NIST National Institutes of Standard and Technology, they uh, investigated the collapse of the buildings, but they didn't pay any attention to any evidence of explosions or explosives. Or any evidence of molten metal. In fact, one of the engineers who wrote the report denied that there was any molten metal seen at the World Trade Center. And it's like, dude, it's all over the place. It's in the basement. It's falling. It's falling off the building. It's in the dust. It's everywhere. I mean, the build. You know, the it, molten iron droplets are are a signature characteristic of the dust of the World Trade Center. So, you know, then then I said, well. Who wrote this report? Who was the mastermind? Who was the person behind the production of this report, the NIST report? 
Mm-hmm. And I, I looked and looked, and I found the guy was a, a, an act or a, a short-term director of the NIST, of the NIST gov- part of the government, sub-agency of commerce, I believe. And his name was Michael Jeffrey or William Jeffrey. Excuse me, William Jeffrey. And I thought, okay, I looked, I looked to find out who, more about William Jeffrey. I couldn't find anything. I spent a whole day looking for who this William Jeffrey was because he, his history says that he grew up near outside Chicago in a place called Arlington Heights, which is very close to where I grew up. So I was interested, who is this guy? And, and then I found out that his parents had changed their name. They'd gotten married, went down to Florida, changed their name from Jeffrey to Jaffe or from Jaffe to Jeffrey and then moved to Chicago and, and put them and presented themselves not as Jewish, but presented themselves as Roman Catholics hmm. and often, often didn't get their name spelled right. I mean, the, the first name was – so they were playing around with their names because they had, they had, they had taken on a new identity. They had become Catholics. And they had changed the name from Jaffe to Jeffrey, and their son was William. And this guy became a very big shot in advanced military technology in the in the government. And then he was appointed to head this NIST report to explain the collapse of the World Trade Center. And in this, this was a completely fraudulent report. Now, this is criminal. This is this is all criminal. All you know, from Michael Sheratov's not, in obstruction of justice, the destruction of evidence, the. Uh, uh, crafting of fraudulent reports like the NIST report, this is all part of a huge criminal conspiracy to defraud the American people. And people like Mr. Jeffrey and Michael Sheratoff and John Ashcroft and Dick Cheney and George Bush, they all have to be basically arrested and um, put on trial. The um, So basically with, with this character Jeffrey's is – this is sort of a a crypto issue or an, or an agent. This is an old strategy, just you know, mm-hmm. a, a, you know, assuming a different name, claiming a false conversion, and then, you know. Yeah, and, but what's important is that it, it, the way it came up to me is, you see, it it, it came up through uh, architects and engineers for nine eleven truth. Mm-hmm. They, they 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 presented this little bit in which they blamed the two engineers, uh, Shyam Sunder, a guy from Iran, I think it is. Yeah, and the other guy's name. John Gross, mm-hmm. uh, he's the engineer who spoke down in Texas and said, we don't see any evidence of molten metal anywhere. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no molten metal. When molten metal is all over the place, as I said, on 9-11. It, it literally cascaded off the South Tower for seven minutes before the building fell. It was found in pools under all three towers that fell that day. Pools. It was found in literally, literally molten iron was found at the basement level at the at the sub basement level at the bedrock level of all three towers and as i said it was found in the dust of all of, of the collapse sure, yeah. all the, yeah. so it's like it's everywhere for him to say it didn't exist this is a flat out lie and and ae 911 truth were pointing at these two men but i said no no it's not the engineers they didn't they didn't craft the do, the policy it's the guy on top it's their boss you know washington is a hierarchy and that's why it was important to find out who the director was and it was, as I said, William William Jeffrey, formerly known as Jaffe. And and when you when you this is another this is this is what I'm saying is that this is showing one more time when you're looking for the missing piece and you find the missing piece, it's got the star of David on the back of it. You know, yeah. you got you got you got you got a Zionist. It's not not a Jewish thing. The star of David is not a Jewish symbol. The star of David is what they call the star of David is a Zionist symbol. It was adopted as a symbol of the state of, of the Zionist movement in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland. It's not a Jewish symbol at all, so it's it's very accurate to use this symbol because this symbol, the star, the so-called uh, hexagram, uh, the uh, the Zionist symbol, is in fact uh, the symbol of Zionism in Israel, and those are the people who we find are responsible for the cover-up of 9/11. And the same thing, as you could say, with the uh, 9/11 Commission with Phil Zelikow, right? Oh yeah, Phil Zelikow. You know, it was supposed to go originally to uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, he wasn't willing to release his client list, and so it went to Philip Zelikow. And Zelikow is a uh, a master. His his degree um, is was his thesis was on the creation and maintenance of the public myth. <laughs> so he he was he was he was yeah. he was a person who has studied and per, and was prepared to create a myth. And and they're they're thinking of these people these these oligarchs is that you just give the give the people myths give them mythology that they can live with. You know, so they're running around in this myth, and and that's the attitude of these people who think they're so superior to us, 
um, who are running our society. This is Leo Strauss, the noble lie. Uh, you know, yes, yeah. yes, noble. Nothing noble about it. No, yeah. And and it's getting more and more and more. You know, like I don't want to get into details, but like the situation right now in California with the fires and with the uh, um, with the with the chaos, with the shootings and and, yeah, and the fires. Yeah. And this is this is this is intentional. This is not this is not happenstance. Things like this, you know, um, California fires. You know they happen. California wildfires happen. But the first thing that that they usually do in the old days is they want to find out who caused the fire, where it started, and who caused it. Because these are arson. These fires that are these wildfires are arson. They're, somebody started the fire. You know, either it either happened by accident, like I think they're trying to say the California Power Company was responsible for the Thomas fire in Santa Barbara. But I mean, it's it's like something happened to spark the fire. It's not lightning. It's not lightning. Well, I mean, you have oligarchs, people like Soros or Sheldon Adelson, who have no who you know. Sheldon Adelson says we should nuke, nuke, we should bop, drop a nuclear bomb on Iran, and yeah. George Soros is busy destabilizing countries, both well, even the United yeah. States with Antifa and these things, but also the the open f- fomenting of civil wars in places like Syria, Libya. And these things and causing the migration, the, the population problems there, the, uh, the, the you know the refugee migration problem, which mm-hmm. is then sp- spilling over into Europe and destabilizing, causing mm-hmm. problems in those countries. So if mm-hmm. they're willing to do all that, I mean, you know, obviously they're willing That's to right. sow uh, chaos in whatever m- ways, even domestically, if they if they they, they can yeah. harbor some benefit, you know, garner some benefit yeah. from it. Domestically, yeah. well, the, the, you know, domestically is you, you can't call it domestically when George Soros is a Hungarian Jew. He's 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 imported. He's a he's a he's a, a villain from abroad. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, and they they are trying to foment war in our country as well. They're trying to foment, um, you know, uh, factionalism. Uh, they're trying to divide us by, you know, uh, ethnic group or or political ideology, mm. what have you. They're 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 that's what I'm saying is that they are they're waging war against us. And they've been waging war against us since 9/11. You know, you know, 9/11 was an act of war against. It was an act of war, not by Afghans or or Al Qaeda, but it was an act of war by the culprits against the American people. That's why it's so important for us to understand who did 9/11 and why it was done. Which is why my books are really important because if you if you understand why who's behind 9/11 and why it was done. You liberate yourself from all this madness and and this uh, uh, deception, and you can you can begin to see the world a little bit more clearly and understand who is the real enemy. And you have to understand who your enemy is if you if you intend to fight a war. Uh, part of it of really understanding the events of nine eleven is uh, I've looked into and I've also studied the research of yours and others regarding sort of the uh, the World Trade Center project itself. The uh, the uh, uh, you know the uh, Port Authority it, it had become sort of this uh, at least from from what I gather from what you've written or others have written sort of this uh, a, a nest or cabal of uh, Zionist criminals is that a fair characterization? No, where is this nest of criminals? I I missed. Oh, the, the New York New York and Jersey Port Authority. Yeah. You know, so the whole thing going on yeah. in the months leading up to. I mean, I'm talking about well, who's Larry Silverstein? Who's oh, yeah. Lauder? I mean, who oh, yeah. who are these? Oh people? yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I. I yeah, absolutely. The the Port Authority is, as you said, the, uh, the the public owner of the World Trade Center was the public owner, and in order for their plot to go ahead, they needed to basically obtain the ownership of the World Trade Center. So they needed to privatize it, and and then to make money off of it, they had to you know insure it. And so what happened was that um, Ronald Lauder. Who the son of Estee Lauder? He was the director of the privatization board under Governor Pataki for New York State, and he decided that they would privatize the World Trade Center. Then, through some very convoluted negotiations, the World Trade Center was turned over to Larry Silverstein, who didn't have the money to he didn't have the money to do this. But uh, he he owned a strip bar or something. He he had owned a strip bar called Runway 69. Yes, in uh, Bronx, I think it was. Is that, is that he, uh, so he comes from that sort of milieu or, or community? Yeah, it, it, the thing is, is that there's, there's the Larry Silverstein, you know, um, who is Larry Silverstein? I, I've written about this because it's, 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 it's a little bit of a mystery. It's like Jeffrey um, Epstein, right? 
<laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit yeah. mystery like Jeffrey Epstein. Exactly, because uh, there's there's there are claims that these are two Larry Silversteins, or uh, Israelis tend to think that it's the same guy. Um, but in any case, he was involved in. Um, he, he was also named in a lawsuit, by the way, Larry Silverstein, um, in a lawsuit with uh, Bill Clinton and others uh, regarding drug smuggling. So um, you know. In any case, he wound up getting the World Trade Center with borrowed money he put down, and the borrowed money came from GMAC, General Motors um, Corporation's you know, financial arm, which went bankrupt in 2008. Mm -hmm. So um, he wound up getting the buildings and then immediately insured them against an act of terrorism and at the same time uh, increased the rents 40%. And, and he also insured his rents, by the way. So then – when 9-11 happened, he wound up getting, uh, after a little bit of litigation with another Zionist judge, uh, Mukasey, he wound up getting a payout of something like $5.2 billion or $5,200 million for a down payment of $100 million of borrowed money. So it's quite a, quite, a, uh, quite a bonus he got that day. And he's the owner of the big you know, World Trade Center now. And if you have been down there to the new World Trade Center site, there's a – there's like these pools. There's some memorial there um, at where the two buildings once stood. And that that memorial itself was also built by the Israelis. <laughs> so so it, it's like it's like every single aspect of this is Israeli, Israeli controlled. And, and, you're, and people are trying to tell me that the Saudis did this or the inside job did this. How can it be that the Israelis control every aspect of this and obstruct justice? prevent an investigation, destroy the evidence, and they're doing this on behalf of the Saudis? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, controlling the perception is so key to this because there's so much evidence, so many, at least evidence, at least grounds for questions or, or investigations, yet uh, the media, the mainstream media, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, ABC, CNN, CBS, Fox News, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I, where are they, right? But then again, if you look at who controls the media, we're in the same. We, we right. find the same problem, right? Right. And the media is 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 the most important part, actually. The media is complicit in this crime. Um, the owners of the media are complicit in the cover up, because now for 17 years they have never investigated anything about 9/11 beyond the official version that they that they that they trumpeted. So it's like, um, yeah. The media is, is supposed to, in a democratic state, the media is supposed to keep the government in check to prevent you know, egregious uh, offenses being done by the government against the people. In this case, we have a very egregious offense being committed, and, and yet the, gov the government and the media have both covered it up, which means that um, the government and the media that we have in our country today are controlled by the people who carried out 9-11. That's the situation. When you, under, when, you, when you understand that, then you can appreciate our, our political predicament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just a few, like a handful of corporations, maybe five or six, that are all yeah. interlocked. That's right. And six this, corporations, six corporations yeah. control over 90% of all the media in the United States of America. And they're, now they're clamping down on, on the internet with Google and YouTube and these things and Facebook. Uh, they've sort of concentrated, they, they concentrate these things, then they're able to clamp down when... Uh, they yeah. have to stifle right. you know, our, our, our alternative views in these things. Uh, it's a very, you know, uh, very uh, critical situation, very dangerous situation uh, that, uh, that we're, that we're but, facing. But, but, but the thing is that the, 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 the Internet is, is, is really quite democratic. I mean if you avoid – I mean if you, if you, if you ignore the, the, the monopoly positions of people like Google and Yahoo, what yes. have you, the media still the, – you know, the, 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 the Internet as a, as a tool – a communication tool um, democratizes information, and and that's to our that's to our advantage. If we didn't have the internet, we would not have any understanding of 9/11 other than what the media tells us. No, I wouldn't even know who you are. <laughs> right, and we wouldn't be able yeah. to have this conversation tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, um, what was my next question? I was going somewhere with this. Um, the uh, the war on terror. The uh, now, it, you, how much are we spending a day on this thing? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. It's it's. Uh, I just looked at it the other day. It's thirty-two million dollars an hour, 
uh, it's two hundred and eighty billion dollars a year. Um, it's a lot of money. Thirty-two billion dollar, thirty-two million dollars per hour. Multiply that by twenty-four. That's a daily price, and then work it up. And it's 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 a hell of a lot of money. I think it was two hundred eighty billion dollars a year we're spending, and it's it's being wasted. You know, it's a lot. Some of that money is going to the TSA and those blue yeah. shirt guys at the airport um, who make you wait in line for you know uh, hours to get checked, um, and then some of it's being spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a very expensive is a very expensive operation actually. Um, until until recently, the fact was, the the figure was four million dollars per hour in Afghanistan. Which was, you know, like 100 million dollars a day. So, w- why are we doing this? Why are we? Why are we in Syria? Why are we in Iraq? Why are we in Afghanistan? What is our interest as Americans? There is none. Which is why Americans should be demanding that our soldiers be brought home. We are not. We have not. There's no declared war between us and any of these countries. So why are we there? Why? And now they're talking about. I've seen. They're talking about decades-long occupation in Syria and Iraq, what have you, Afghanistan. Yeah, it, it, this, we, is, this is this yeah. is madness. This is sheer madness. Well, Americans have become habituated to militarism. You know, these, this is, goes back to even the NSC '68 and the idea that you had to have sort of military Keynesianism, large defense spending to support the economy, and then then you got to create the enemy to just fight the, uh, the, the, the 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 military spending in these things. Uh, but Americans in many ways have become habituated to having hundreds of bases overseas, having these these wars being fought or dust ups or whatever. You know, you, you make the point that you learned recently that a couple soldiers died in Niger. Well, what, what are American troops doing in Niger? Americans don't even know. You know, you know. Right. Uh, and I, I was watching um, a couple of years ago. I was watching the Super Bowl, and there's an ad. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know. It, in between, you know, during a break, a commercial break, and the ad is, I think it's for uh, Lockheed Martin, perhaps, mm-hmm. and it shows a base in central or eastern Poland, a, a marine base, mm-hmm. and they're watching the NFL, and there are, our troops are being entertained by the NFL, and, mm-hmm. and it's a cold base. I guess it's idea it's around Super Bowl time, so it's January or February. Mm-hmm. But of course, the suggestion is that our troops are defending freedom on the borders of Poland and Russia. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and this is something that we should we should accept. This is normal. Mm-hmm. You know, or Okinawa right. for that matter, or even still in Germany. Germany's still occupied, right? I mean, it's it's right. incredible. I mean, right. Good point. That's a very good point. Um, it's unusual that I hear uh, an American say such a thing. Yes, Amer- uh, Germany is still occupied. Uh, World War II has not been legally closed. There's no there's no uh, peace treaty between the United States and Germany. Um, so that a lot of things are in limbo. Um, that's why Russia. I mean, that's why Russia maintains its presence in Kaliningrad in Königsberg. Um, they were only allowed to stay. They were only uh, told they could stay there until there's a peace treaty with Germany. Uh, and until a peace treaty happens, they're allowed to stay there. <laughs> and it's interesting. It's interesting that Putin. When he was visiting, I think it was in Japan a, a couple months ago, he offered off the cuff, he offered Japan a peace treaty to end the war with Japan. And I thought that was quite a bold thing for him to talk about this because uh, Russia is a beneficiary of, of the fact that there is no peace treaty with Japan or in this case with, the, uh, with uh, Germany vis-a-vis uh, the United States. So, yeah um, – there is a war party. There is a, very much a war party. You know, you, you live in, in northern Virginia. You understand that. You know, you just take the take the metro through Pentagon Station sometime. And the, there is a war party, a very very big war industry in the United States of America. Um, but there is a there is a, a foreign influence in this war party that is able to manipulate the United States into foreign wars that are not in our interest. And and what's really necessary is that the United States. Um, that we go back to the uh, strict uh, constitutional interpretation of who can declare war, and it's only Congress that can declare war. Yeah, yeah. Um, by allowing the executive to wage wars here and there willy-nilly um, under the authorization to use military force after 9-11, we've opened up a can of worms, and we have absolutely um, – this has to come to a screeching halt. Yeah, at least uh, uh, prior to the Korean War – when they lied us in the war, the president had to go before Congress and request a declaration of warfare. 
uh, didn't prevent those wars, but at least they had, he had to, they had to go through the motions. Uh, but you do make a good point about the uh, the involvement of foreign influence, and this was something even George Washington, you know, warned against the in, these foreign entanglements of and these things. How we we would we would become enslaved to foreign interest, and that is the history of the United States going back at least as far back as the early 20th century. It isn't just Zionist or Jewish. It's uh, we, of course you had British or uh, primarily the British and their influence. In America, it, you know, especially in regards to the First and Second World Wars, the influence of British intelligence, William Stevenson, mm -hmm. man called intrepid. Uh, but it became sort of Anglo Zio because you had the strange relation between the British Empire and Zionism and also mm -hmm. Freemasonry, which I haven't quite figured out yet, honestly. It's just mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, at the end of the day, you have foreign interest sort of inveigling themselves and taking over, primarily. It's, the East Coast establishment, because you had the dynamic during the Second World War, at least to run up to it when Roosevelt was dragging us into the war. Midwestern opposition, particularly uh, expressed in the American First Committee, and that mm -hmm. became a target of the ADL and the FBI because of their opposition to Roosevelt's policies. They were a loyal country. In fact, they had reports from uh, Catholic FBI agents, because for some reason the FBI always attracted Catholics. That's one way the empire attracted Catholics was the FBI. <laughs> but um, you had these FBI agents writing Hoover saying that the American First Committee was not a, a German agent. It was, they weren't German spies, they were just loyal Americans, and they should not be harassed. The mm -hmm. FBI agent was perhaps naive because the empire was not going to brook such opposition. They, they were going to get their way, and largely this was the drive to war. Then was largely uh, uh, British and also uh, well, well, Jewish too at the time. And mm -hmm. you know, Charles Lindbergh was right when he said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, they claimed yeah. they boasted after the war. I think it was Ginsburg's book, uh, "The Fatal Embrace," about he said how Jew Jewish organizations boasted after the war that they were they were pivotal in getting the United States into the war to defeat Hitler. So they admit, right. you, know, you know, right. And it's it's um, it's not so much Jewish organizations as Zionist organizations. Mm -hmm. Like the um, the uh, Balfour Declaration that uh, from 1917, that that is basically the uh, a birth certificate for the state of Israel, yeah. was a personal letter uh, <laughs> was a personal letter written to Lord Rothschild, um, and Lord Rothschild is the is the is the head of organized Jewry in Britain, and the reason for the Balfour Declaration in Britain promising a, a support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine was to get the United States into the war on the side of Britain um, and to get American Jews to support the war effort. And well, it, worked, like, it, worked, it worked. Yeah, like so uh, it, I think it was like Untermeyer and Brandeis and those guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's right. So it, it worked. And so you, that's, I'm, that's what I'm saying is that this war party um, that, is, that is taking control of our, our country um, and is, is taking us into these wars, this is not – it is not in America's interest. I, I have to repeat that time and time again because – People have to understand that we are being we are being abused. Our nation's being abused. Our military is being abused. We are being taken into wars that are not our wars. We have no reason to be in these wars, and and by fighting these wars, these wrongful criminal wars, wars of aggression, as they are, um, we are we are uh, causing great hardship for our soldiers, for our nation, for our for our civilians, but for our soldiers, and that's why we have. Things like what happened in in Thousand Oaks, California, mm -hmm. and not not these, to mention these, the million, millions of people suffering in Yemen or Syria or Libya. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But we we're having like uh, something like a, an average of twenty two Marines a day or twenty two veterans a day committing suicide on average, um, and and of course we we're, we've we've destroyed whole nations. We've destroyed Libya. We've destroyed um, Iraq and and Afghanistan, and you know it's we're 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 wreaking havoc across the whole region and it's like to accept this as normal like i said in the back of my book to accept this yeah. this this endless war as normal is um is insane and the only way you can the only way you can break out of this this uh this nightmare is to understand the true source of it to under, because it's it's not it's not a mystery it's not something that we can't understand it's not something that's that's beyond our our ability to comprehend if you read my little book the war on terror mm -hmm. In, in two hours, you'll have it all understood. Yes, that's a, it, is, it is excellent in that regard. It, it is a, it's a concise treatment, analysis of what is the war on terror. Uh, but I guess it is good for like, you know, the war is good for like pharmaceutical companies who produce the psychotropic drugs that the soldiers are become uh, put on when they come back home and they suffer PS, P, 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 PTSD and these things, <laughs> yeah, who are owned by a few families, by the way, these, mm -hmm. these, these companies like the Sackler family. And like, um, 
interesting. You, now, you, you, these are Zionist wars for a foreign government. Israel, uh, America is being bankrupted. Perhaps will be thrown thrown aside like a you know exhausted husk, like the British Empire was in the 20th century <laughs> when all is said and done. But you, such criticism, although I think you're you're aware of this, opens you up for accusations. I think the ADL calls you anti-Semitic. You're anti-Semitic mm. conspiracy theorist. You're obviously you're 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 telegraphing Hitler. By... Yeah. Well, they're they're going to say that. Yeah. They're always, they're going to say that. You know, they've been saying that about me since 2001, when I November 2001, when I first wrote about the explosives in the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they call such criticism anti-Semitic. It's nonsense. Just, but but that's what they do. But I want to point out also that um, when we talk about this being a Zionist plot, you have to understand that the Zionist, the Zionist uh, uh, beast has uh, uh, a lair in in London. In New York, in Hollywood, in Miami, in Paris. Uh, so, for example, right now uh, President Bush is President Trump is visiting um, Macron in Paris mm -hmm. for the hundredth anniversary of the end of the First World War. Macron, Emmanuel Macron, is a, is a Rothschild agent. He's a he's a Rothschild employee, has been for a long time, and he was put in position. He was put in that place to be an agent of the Rothschilds. Um, to stop, they they had to stop that populist candidate um, Marine Le Pen from winning the election. So they put in this Macron, and and you know, the, the un, you have to understand that the the, the hinterland, the um, yeah, the hinterland of the Zionist state of Israel is the city of London, the city of New York, etc., where they have where they have very influential um, comrades who control finance, like the Rothschilds, uh, who control Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Who control the what the Americans consume in, in news media, um, in entertainment? You know, it's it's all a, a giant in terms of uh, media. It's a giant psy operation, psyop against the American people, uh, twenty four seven. Yeah, I mean the character Arnold Milchin is a great illustration of that. Where he produces movies, he's also a Zionist agent. I Meaning he's actually he was involved in nuclear espionage, correct? Yes, yes, he's the Israeli agent. He was he was the one who. Who basically was the, the 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 money man? He would he would control bank accounts held outside of Israel for Mossad for operations that they conducted. One of them one of the operations they conducted it's a group called uh, uh, LACAM, was to obtain the components for nuclear bombs from the United States and other countries to bring to Israel. And he was their main agent, and he was uh, the guy that uh, shipped something like 850 nuclear triggers. These are the little devices that trigger a nuclear bomb. Um, he sent them to Israel illegally, of course. And when 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 the Department of Treasury caught on to it, they indicted his employees, the American employees. But the oh, the guy behind it, Arnon Milchan, his name was not even in the indictment. <laughs> so he's got like a Teflon. He's got a Teflon coating, right? And and yeah, and this guy's a, a very high level guy. You know, they he he was working for Shimon Peres. Um, these are the masterminds behind 9/11 and, and a lot of the big crimes that, that Israel's carried out in the last 30 years. They're 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 well, terrorists. Well, when the U.S. attorneys are like Michael Chertoff, you know, you can run cover like this. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I yeah. was reading about some of the financial angle, uh, just how um, the state of Ohio, uh, mm -hmm. their uh, the state pension fund, was investing in Israeli bonds, mm -hmm. and uh, this was. Some caused kind of a mini controversy, but at the end of the day, the the, uh, the state the funds are being used to to, to uh, finance Israel, and it turns yeah. out the guy the comptroller is uh, is uh, you know a, another dual citizen. This yeah. is how in deep it yeah. is, you know. And then you come yeah. across acting like a conspiracy theorist when you're saying, "Well, I don't know." Well, this is how he's, this is. He's, I guess they they call him Sayanim, I think is a term for the... Say, Sayan. Sayan, Sayan uh, plural is Sayanim. It, it's well, it's like it's like. Um... The mayor of Chicago is Rahm Emanuel. Yes. Rahm Emanuel, if you were to take that man and put him into a prison and start interrogating him, you would find out all kinds of things about 9-11. Yes. Because he was, he, was he was the mastermind in the White House prior to 9-11, for eight years prior to 9-11, who was responsible for, you know, he was the Mossad man in the White House. He's yeah, an Israeli chief of staff agent. For, yeah, for Bill Clinton, right? Well, he was, he was special advisor to Bill Clinton. Yeah. He was the guy that ran the Oval Office. He's probably the guy that got Lewinsky in there and, yes, yes. and, and that operation. Um, <laughs> yes. But in any case, he, he was the guy that, that would tell Bill Clinton, well, we gotta, we got to appoint this guy to the bench in New York. you got to appoint this guy to the bench in Connecticut. You know, He's the guy that 
advised Clinton on what to do. Is he the guy that got Hellerstein installed? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And what what, what now Hellerstein? That's an interesting Judge Hellerstein. Yeah. What, what purpose yeah. did he serve in the uh, or what role did he serve in covering up nine eleven? Yeah, Alvin K. Hellerstein was the federal judge in the District of New York who oversaw the tort litigation. Um, you know, there were there were three thousand families that lost somebody on nine eleven, mm-hmm. and um, of those three thousand families, basically two thousand nine hundred of them uh, took the federal compensation fund money, signed the dotted line that they would not litigate further, and went home, and grieved at home with their money. Mm-hmm. There were 100 families, basically 96 families, I think it was, who held out for a day in court to find out exactly who was responsible for the loss of their loved one. And this went became a tort litigation in the District of New York, held uh, presided over by Larry uh, uh, Alvin K. Hellerstein. Now, Alvin K. Hellerstein is a is a dedicated Zionist agent, um, as is his wife. Uh, but and there's a there was a fundamental problem with Mr. Hellerstein. In that his son is a lawyer in Israel, lives in Israel on a West Bank on a settlement, and his son is a lawyer for an Israeli company that sir, that represents the defendant in the tort litigation. This Israeli company that oversaw passenger screening at the airports in New York City and Boston and Dulles on 9/11. That company is called ICTS. It was based in Holland. It's an Israeli Mossad company, and they controlled passenger screening at the American airports. So they were in the they were in the defendant's seat. And because the son works for them in Israel, the father had a conflict of interest because their primary family member, his son, is involved with one of the defendants in his case. So obviously he recused himself, right? He should have. He didn't though. <laughs> yeah. And and I presented this evidence to the American people through my website and my writings. Years before it, you know, before this uh, case was solved, um, but it didn't make it, it didn't get any traction. The New York media ignored it. Um, you know, they didn't write about the litigation very much. Um, the judge just wanted to wrap the whole thing up. And what they did is they waged a war of attrition against the defendant, against the families. And one by one, every family was settled out of court until no one was left standing. So all the families from 9/11 have been settled. And there has never been one day in court. There hasn't been one minute in court to find any legal discovery for who, who did 9-11. Hmm. So follow this. Hellerstein, who was appointed to the bench by Bill Clinton on the advice of one Rahm Emanuel, an, IDF, an admitted IDF uh, 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 veteran, yeah. I guess. But yeah, his father sure. was an Ergun or Hargana terrorist or – his father was in the Stern Gang. Stern Gang, even worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Murderers. So he is an Israeli yeah. agent, but then – so he's advising – now this judge goes on who's appointed a Zionist, uh, Rahm Emanuel, appoint, uh, suggests Bill Clinton – suggests yeah. Bill Clinton, who's um, in, he was fooling around with Monica Lewinsky, perhaps another yeah. agent. Um, yeah. And he, he get this guy gets on the bench just before 9-11. Then he yeah, then half he, a year. then that judge proceeds to run interference, clear interference and violations yeah. of all you know yeah. ethics and yeah. staying on the bench and to, to, to stifle. Yeah, the so they, they they get this guy in position to handle the the tort litigation uh, before the case even comes up. See, you have to understand that this nine eleven operation was planned decades in advance, mm-hmm. so that the culprits behind nine eleven. If you understand that, and you can look at it from a three dimensional point of view or four dimensional point of view, you can see that things were done before. Um, in order to prepare the stage, um, and and the things were done after to you know, but this is all planned in advance, and you know this was meticulous meticulous planning, and and that's how it succeeded because the American people are generally pretty um, honest, very honest people mostly, and because they're honest people, um, they don't think like that, and so they're they're not they're not they're easily they're easily deceived. Um, because we are, because our people, honest people, are taken advantage of. Yeah, yeah. And and so we need to have, we need to have, crafty, cunning attack dogs who work for us. Yes. We need we need that that kind of people to fight these people back, to resist them, to 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 pull them out of the government, to put them on trial. And there's clearly no political will to try any of these people. But that's what we need. We need to have a a, a big 9/11 trial, and you know. Because it's gone for so long, the the list of characters involved in this operation is pretty long. 
but they have to be all arrested and um, and held accountable for 9/11 and the war on terror. We got to start clawing back the money and and get, and getting the people arrested and cleaning. You know what the, what Trump says, draining the swamp. It's time to start doing it. It's um, you mentioned the sort of the problem not, the problem of the sort of the transnational quality or character of Zionism, meaning that everywhere where there is mm-hmm. a Zionist Jew or identifies with Israel, he's an agent of that state, regardless of what host country he lives in, or even what citizenship he claims or has. And this That's is right. a problem. You mentioned this Judge Hellestein. There's always been a problem with federal judges in Zionism, because going back to Brandeis uh, and, and, mm-hmm. and Frankfurter, the, the minute you you uh, apply a little uh, uh, sunlight on the career, you find that there were agents of a foreign That's right. foreign interest. And, That's... and this interest of dual citizenship, secret society, is, and the, the parushim, and these things. Are, this is a secret right. society, and you cannot be a judge. Be, you shouldn't be a judge to be a member of secret society because it contradicts your oath of office. Um, that's, that's right. basic, but, um, that's it, right. Good I, for you. I mean, I was reading a book uh, called state secrets by Leon de Ponsens, and it, this is mm-hmm. <laughs> dealing with the formation around the time of the Balfour declaration. We talk about Zionist or Jewish Zionist power. It's sort mm-hmm. of, it's not at this time didn't have a state, but it was there. It was all over the yeah. place. You know, that's, that's right. It's hard to identify. It makes it hard to, hard to fight, but this is a, something, this is an example of the British empire at that time, probably. I guess the most powerful uh, uh, state on, on on the planet, it's soon to be, you know, I guess supplanted by the United States. But um, mm-hmm. this is uh, something a letter that was written threatening the British Empire. Uh, it was under these circumstances. Now I'll read this to you. It's, it's called the Landman mm-hmm. document, and it was under these circumstances conditions that the Anglo American Zionists published a threatening warning to the British government by means of the Landman document, addressing the British government as if they were speaking to an equal. Remember, they don't have a state yet. They yeah. said, in effect, and this is what the kids, you forget that you did not give us Palestine as an unsolicited gift, the Balfour Declaration. Mm-hmm. It was handed over as a result of a secret bargain concluded between ourselves. We have scrupulously observed our part in bringing America into the war on your side. We call mm-hmm. on you to fulfill your obligations in turn. You are aware of our power in the United States. Take care that you do not attract hostilities of Israel. Otherwise, you will come up against come against grave international difficulties. This is 1919. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. Very 30, interesting. I mean, almost 30 years before Israel was formed. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I, you, you, there is Zionist or Jewish part of what we want to call. There's agency, there's organization, there's APAC, it's, there's JINSA, there's Hollywood and these things. It's, it's what it yeah. is in short is, is international gangsterism. Mm-hmm. It's, it's gangsterism writ large. It's like, we're living in times like, uh, when the James Bond books were written, James Bond would have these mega criminals, you know, who, who sought global control of a something. And it's happened. It's real. He was right. James Bond was right. I think they killed Ian Fleming when he was 55 years old. I don't think he died a natural death because he, he knew exactly what he was talking about. And he was making it into popular, you know, novels. And, uh, you know, he, he was right, and that's exactly what we're living under. This is a, a form of gangsterism. Mm-hmm. These people do not; they don't; they don't; they 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 don't play by the by the book. They they take control of our government surreptitiously and by fraud. Um, you know, they they have people on their hook. They threaten people. They extort. Use extortion. They use blackmail. They use Jeffrey Epstein's. You know, and mm-hmm. and 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 they use uh, their their bankruptcy lawyers and everything to control our politicians. This this international gangsterism of Zionism has to be uprooted out of – at least out of our country, out of our, our Western countries. Um, and, and you know that's why the boycott movement is so important because this little Israeli state, when, when the world realizes the, its gangster quality and when the people as a whole just say, forget about it. We're not going to buy their products. Um, that that state will have a hard time existing because it it has no friends in the world really. Yeah. All of its all of its allies are basically allies that are, as you said, you know, extorted to be allies or, or threatened. Yeah, they're blackmailed and bribed. Yeah. Or both right. at the same time. It, right. And yeah. and when when you know like like Adam uh, William uh, Alan Sabrowski wrote in the foreword to my little book, The War on Terror, he said that when when the American people wake up and realize what Israel has done to them on nine eleven. Uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be bad for them. And, uh, you know, he's right. He, he, he's, he's absolutely right about that. 
But um, it's not the American people that do anything. It's the our government. And as long as our government's hands are tied, um, nothing will be done. Yeah, and the guilty so parties are, are – they're the, the, the Jewish oligarchs, the big Jews, uh, the people – it's B'nai B'rith, it's ADL. And they more or less they, – they've psychologically captured the, the little Jews like they've done the larger population. So when we're criticizing Jewish organizations, we say the Jews – same way we say Germans or the Japanese. We're talking about organizations. Right, Not, like B'nai B'rith. Yeah. B'nai B'rith. Yeah. B'nai B'rith is a Masonic organization of Zionist men, mm -hmm. completely secret, right? And 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 it's it's like the super user of 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 Masonic organizations because the members of B'nai B'rith can belong to other Masonic organizations, but not the other way around. Yes. You know because you have to be a Zionist Jew to be a member of B'nai B'rith, so that gives them super user privileges among other Masonic groups. And Masonic groups are all very much, uh, you know, fashioned after this kind of Kabbalah, yes, Jewish mysticism stuff, yes. a bunch of bunch of nonsense. But this is the this is the Zionist framework that masonic people people who are masons are indoctrinated with yeah it's great so for they, secrecy networking and intrigue yeah yeah right Thank yeah, i mean you. It, it was a technology of the british empire the the, the lodge yeah. right you know yeah yeah so i mean yeah i mean that's an important point and you realize is the um they have no problem uh killing people even killing little jews to achieve their objectives yeah, yeah. that's right they, they they kill a lot of them and um and 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 it's it the the Jew, the American Jew or the Western Jew, is actually um, a victim two times from 9/11, for example, because it's like they're 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 tricked into supporting the criminals um, because of their tribal affiliation, and they're deceived like everybody else is. Yeah. So it's it's like for 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 American Jews or in this case, it's a double whammy, whether they're Zionists or not. It they're hit they're hit twice, and so. You know, I feel sorry for them because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a very, it's a very bad thing when you have zealots like, you know, Netanyahu and uh, Ehud Barak and the Rothschilds doing terrible things, and and like kind of like dragging you along as accomplices because yeah. of your, because of your tribal affiliation. It's mm -hmm. very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a serious problem. I don't exactly know what direct political action at this point is even possible. But of course, before we take any direct political action, you need widespread consciousness and the first step awareness to that, awareness absolutely. yeah and is re absolutely well, right reading your books right <laughs> absolutely right tim that's absolutely right he said like like i said you can't you can't fight a war if you don't understand who the enemy is mm -hmm. and if you have the if you're deceived about 9 11 and the war on terror then you are then you are then you are in you are unable to respond in any intelligent way so that the first thing you need to do is get the intelligence. You have to have the awareness of of what really happened on 9-11 and what the war on terror is all about. When you understand those two things, then you will be able to 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 you'll be you'll be prepared to uh, make the right decisions. And uh, that's why I, I think my books are are unique in the 9-11 research. Solving 9-11, The Deception Changed the World, and the bigger book is the original articles. And the war on terror, the plot to rule the Middle East. Yes, and all those. Uh, where would you direct people to get those books? Well, they can, people can get them through the internet from bookstores like mm -hmm. uh, Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble, but in online bookstores, I guess that's pretty popular these days. Or they can order them through me um, through my website bolin.com because it, it's cheaper that way. Um, B o l l y n dot com, and there's a donation button there, and for Fifty dollars, they can get the entire set of three books, which is uh, twenty dollars cheaper, at least, than than Amazon offers the whole set. Which also supports your research and work. So, yes, yes, well, yes, it, it does support me a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this is a it's a, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, it's uh, been now seventeen years, so it's not it's not um, it's not very lucrative to to be the uh, the odd guy who's who's pointing out no. what happened on nine eleven. <laughs> No. But it's essential. It has to be done. It's like some people say it's a labor of love. You have to do it. The truth matters. And um, it, it's, it's really sad to see my nation and, and other nations um, so woefully deceived into such terrible situations like the war on terror. It's really sad. Yes, it is. It's upsetting. But we can't let it – can't fall into despair. You just have to uh, you know, continue on and That's right. take some sort of action, at least spread the word so people can understand what's going on. That's what I try to do. At least. At least. Yeah. At least spread the word. That's right, Tim. And also you don't find yourself being as scared as much. 
Of course not. Because of course not. That's a very good point. Uh, fear is is something that they're pushing on us. You know, the alternative media, the mainstream mm-hmm. media, they push fear because when they when when people are afraid, they are easily controlled, and and they control themselves. So it's a very useful tool for you know oligarchs, and and when as I'm saying, when you understand what really is going on, the fear di- dissipates because you don't have to be afraid of Muslims. You don't have to be afraid of Middle Eastern people. You don't have to be afraid of Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. No, there's nothing to be afraid of. It, when you when you understand the, the the deception, then you become emboldened and you 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 no longer have fear, and that's a that's a big plus. And the magic, lo- the black magic, loses its power. <laughs> Amen. Exactly. At that point. So, well, listen, Christopher, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know you spent a good amount of time with me this afternoon. And I know we're, we're speaking on the eve of the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day, 1918, the uh, cessation of hostilities at the end of the Great Slaughter of World War One, which really shaped the 20th century, even the 21st century. Um, at 11 o'clock on the 11th, on the 11th day, of the 11th month. That's right. Very Kabbalistic. Um, <laughs> oh, he chose it that way. Yeah. That's right. And uh, do... Un- Observe that day, and, and, and I know a lot of people now reflect on those days as we acknowledge. Although this in the United States, is, this is more for Memorial Day for those who have fallen for the country, died in service of their country. We acknowledge, but really, I think the original idea of Mrs. Day was sort of a lamentation of the slaughter, the, right. the, the, the disaster that it was, and that's how we should look at these things. We shouldn't just uh, sort of take the right. sentimental approach and think about uh, the soldiers who gave their lives. We should talk about, well, these soldiers who were tricked into being fodder for empire and be more critical of the decisions that were taken by the political leaders and the oligarchs to handle them and maybe uh, try them uh, posthumously in history for the crimes they committed that led to to the great slaughter. And uh, 100 years, um, and again, that's another thing where, you uh, you know, not understanding the war on terror, not understanding World War I or World War II or the Korean War or Vietnam and these things, we have a complete misunderstanding of these events and we should question, really uh, study the hidden grammar and secrecy, you know, the true story behind those events so we could get a better understanding and stop this thing. You know, me, me, you know. That's right. So I'll let you go. That's uh, uh, Anything else? I mean, anything else? Uh, no, I, um, I'm, I'm working on the, uh, uh, another book which, in which I'll put my writings from 2012 until today in, a, in, a, in another format because the internet being a temporary thing as it is mm-hmm. – um, I need to put this information down into a booklet, that, a book that will last, uh, because you know the war on terror is uh, is now part of our history, yes. and it, it's it's going to be a part of our history for a long time because it's not over yet. And it, you know, when when I hear people at the Pentagon talking about staying in Syria or Iraq for decades, um, I just, you know, you want to <laughs> wring somebody's neck. This is outrageous. It has to end. We've got it. We've got to take our country back, and we've got to, you know. Get rid of this this nonsense uh, uh, carnage in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, and that we've been tricked into. Yeah. So, Tim, thank you very much for having me on your show. Oh, you certainly uh, thank you, and you're, uh, you're welcome, and, and thank you for coming on the show. When I'm going to post this uh, probably in a day or so, when I do, I'll send you the link. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy the uh, the uh, the beautiful uh, winter out there. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. So long. Bye bye.